Thank you, thank you. So I want to thank the scientific committee for, for the invitation. And um, <coughs> so what we're going to work on is some problem I, I kind of learned recently, which is, so you have some dynamically defined uh, set, invariant set, like some, uh, some hyperbolic attractor, for example, or some limit set of some discrete group. And what you want to understand is the, the hardware dimension of this invariant set. And specifically, we want to give some dynamical description. Um, so the thing is, this is pretty understood in the conformal case, meaning that the derivative of your dynamics uh, is, is a homotopy in some sense. But when, uh, when your dynamics is non-conformal, this is uh, this is pretty open until maybe very recently, I guess, like a few months ago, uh, for some cases. <coughs> so what we're going to work on is um, we're going to pick some discrete group. So matrices. So here I'm going to pick um, R or C. So the C case actually provides some interesting examples. And um, so this is a discrete group. And we're going to look at its action on the um, projective space, say, or other Grassmannian spaces, like k, k planes <coughs> of PD, right? So under uh, kind of mild conditions on gamma, there's going to be, there's going to be some speci special invariant set, which we're going to call the limit set. Minimal, uh, closed, and gamma invariant. So I guess I should put uh, this, this here, at this first, actually, so that this makes sense. <coughs> so it, as I said, in, with my conditions, there's only one of these sets. This is a, a statement of Benoit. But OK, we went by. So, so we have this set anyway. And um, what we want to understand is exactly is uh, this half of dimension uh, of this, this guy. For, um, so this has some Romanian metric, right? Some metric invariant under the compact group, the maximum compact group of these guys, like the angle, for example. And so what you want to uh, understand this is they dynamically understand this number. So maybe write it down as some critical exponent uh, and whatever this means. <coughs> so let me introduce some notation. And so basically, I can kind of explain just why, unless d equal to this is a non-conformal case, right? Uh, so let me use this to introduce some notation. So let's pick some elements. And um, let's pick some norm on KD. So this inner product is going to be the usual inner product if um, k equals r and um, some emission product for k equals c. So you have this, you have these singular values, right? And these are real numbers. And we're going to order them. So what are the singular values? So the first one is the norm of the operator, and the, well, the product of i of them is the norm of the exterior power of the operator. So another way of saying that is that you pick your ellipse, you pick your um, ball of radius, um, your sphere of radius one, and you're going to push it by your your element, and this is going to be an ellipse. And these numbers are the axis, the length of the axis of the ellipse. <coughs> so for example, 
<coughs> say for example that uh, it is what we call maybe proximal, say that you have a gap, maybe just say like this. So if, for example, right, if you have a gap in the first uh, index, say, so <coughs> you, you can consider these spaces, right? You, you can consider the, the top axis of this ellipse. So this is going to be this, what it is. Let's put it right in this way. Of this ellipse, right? So you will draw it like this. So you have your ball. And um, so these are real numbers. Huh? You have your ball, and this goes to some ellipse. This has some axis. So this is sigma 1 of 3, uh, sigma 2 of 3, and sigma 3. <coughs> so this is going to be uh, u1. And what's going to be, uh, let me just define u d minus 1 of the inverse, right? It's going to be the pre image of uh, this. Uh, this other uh, axis, uh, the space defined by the other axis. So it's gonna it's gonna lie here, right? So th there is an, an orthonormal set going to some orthonormal set. One of them is the one that maximizes the norm, and the other is this. I'm gonna call this space here. Uh, that space. So, so what happens here, right? So if you pick a, a small cone, <coughs> around this or, uh, orthogonal direction to this space, so this guy is going to the, this attracting guy, u1 of g, right? But it's gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be uh, a ball, right? It's gonna be some sort of ellipse on, around this guy, so it's gonna be something like this. Let me put some drawings, maybe. Right? And the axis, so, so what happens when I look at the action in projective space? So what happens when I look at the action in projective space? So this is some, some hyperplane, right? And so this cone is some, we can think about it as the complementary of a neighborhood of this hyperplane. This projectivized hyperplane, right, like that. Right? And so when I apply G, right, this cone here, when the projectivized is going to be some, some ellipse, right, of course. So it's going to be kind of near this point, which is u1 of g, and the axis of the ellipse are going to be ratios of uh, the top eigenvalue and the other ones, right? So this set is going to be coarsely, let me put it this way. Right? Right? Uh, this, this is how you, you contract in sympathetic space, right? <coughs> so what you say, say, say that if your, your element lies in, in some discrete group, as, as we want to understand, right? <coughs> so the limit set is going to come more or less over there if G is very big, right? Probably. You don't know. So basically what you have to understand is so how this intersection of the ellipse, understand this intersection of this ellipse with this limit set, right? And kind of the position of the ellipse occupies in this, in this limit set. And understanding what is the relation of the intersection, right? This diameter of intersection with, with related to the axis of the, of the ellipse, right? 
<coughs> this is a kind of situation, right? So there is some conjectural picture. I don't know if anyone actually did this conjecture or not. <coughs> but it's some number called the affinity exponent. So there is, there is some, some sort of broken Dirichlet series and uh, which depends on all these numbers. And the critical exponent of this broken Dirichlet series is, is expected to be this Hausdorff dimension of this set. Um, Unless the situation is very degenerate. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to kind of start telling you the examples that we, we, we managed to say something about. Um, so let me, let, 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 let me start with something that is known, which is specifically the conformal case in this case, right? So d equal 2, right? So for example, PSR2C is the, the isometry group um, of uh, H3. Right. Up to some finite covering, maybe. And I'm going to pick some group here, and I'm going to make some definition, right? So this, this guy is going to be convex co-compact. This is a definition that I'm going to make. So there are several ways of. Uh, Defining this, which are all equivalent, this one is this embedding, so this function here, this embedding function, is a quasi geometric embedding. So what is this? This is saying that distances of the images of this guy are comparable, like quasi by Lipschitz, or just comparable, say, to intrinsic distances in the group as an abstract group. Another way of saying this is like uh, you can look at this quotient. And uh, the geodesic flow here. Um, has a, uh, it's no wonder it's set is compact. Right? So this is another way of saying this. And the last one is what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to consider the limit set in the, in the action in the boundary. So there's several ways to define this, but I pick some point, I look at its orbit, and I look at the closure of the orbit. When I add the boundary at infinity, right? Right, so this boundary at infinity in this case is just P1 of C or R in this case. We, we, we could do it for R2. And uh, why convex co compact? Because the convex hole, so the convex hole of the set. Is gamma invariant? Is uh, gamma invariant? So this is always true, of course. And its action and the action is co compact. The quotient is compact. So basically, what you're doing is you look at the limit set, you fill it with geodesics. So this gives you a gamma invariant set. And the, you're, you're requiring that the action on this, on this invariant set, the, the quotient is compact. So, so what do we know in this case is a term of Sullivan. Right? What does Sullivan say? So that the half of dimension of this uh, limit set is the critical exponent of, of the group. Or we can could, we could state it like the, it's a topological entropy of this flow, for example. But in, we're more, more interested in this critical exponent approach. So, has a dimension of the limit set is critical exponent of the series of 
So this number can be computed explicitly. So if you've never seen this, so let me just say a word, which is, so this series is convergent for big S. So you're going to look at the smallest S that makes this, this series converge. And this is expon this exponent. And you can write it down like this also, right? So this uh, uh, an exponential growth rate. <coughs> So this, this is typically a conformal situation, right? The action on the boundary is conformal, so it sends a ball to a ball. So here, what, what you have to understand in this case is, which is not easy, but Sullivan did it, thanks. Oh. A critical exponent. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the formula. The distance from O to gamma O. The distance from O to gamma O. Yes, yeah, so the, what you're doing is you pick some ball of radius T inside this H3, and you look at how many points you have of the orbit of O on this ball, and you look how this, uh, the exponential growth rate of this, of these numbers. Pick some point, any point. The exponential doesn't depend on the point. And then... <coughs> So we're going to take kind of this example and uh, put it in some non-conformal situation. So maybe I don't want to erase that drawing. So what are we going to do? We're going to, the first thing we're going to do is to put our SL2 in some SLD. Right? So th this is the first thing we're going to do. Yes. Okay. Ah. So it's this number. <laughs> <laughs> so no, the, the thing is, yeah, I'm gonna tell you. So, so this, this series, so this is a function of s. And um, when s is very big, this is convergent. And you look at the, the smallest s that make this converge. And this why is this kind? Why? No, this is the theorem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, but okay. Why is okay. <laughs> so the idea is that, so you see, you have, this, so, okay, so here, uh, maybe I should say this, in this specific case, doesn't really, mm, okay. So the thing is that this distance, So you have your O and gamma O, and you look at this point at infinity, right? So this is H3. Right. And so this is going to be some sort of your U1. You have somewhere else the repelling guy. So this is gamma, sorry. Right, so what you're going to do is, so there are two parts, right? Hazard dimension, it's kind of easy to bound it above and hard to bound it below, right? So what actually is going on is that these numbers, <coughs> this, uh, so I, as I was saying, so say you pick a small ball here and you look at the complement and you push it by gamma, right? So this is gonna give you here some small neighborhood of this guy. And what is gonna be the, the radius or the diameter of this guy is gonna be something like that. Which is actually, it's actually what I said right there, it's in the conformal case. And so, so in some sense you find a covering, right, with the, with the right uh, diameters, right? What you have to understand is, as I said before, the, the position of the limit set actually, the, the position of the limit set with respect to this, to this ball, right? 
A priori, the limit set could be very bad with respect to this bool. So this, co this kind of this complex co-compact uh, co condition is, is kind of saying that when gamma is very big, this guy kind of goes through the center. <coughs> That's more or less what's going on. So this would be the upper bound. The upper bound is harder, and you have to introduce some measures, some patterns and Sullivan measures. So in some sense, yeah. <coughs> So in a very, in a very broad sense, maybe. So what we realize is, 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 is that in some non-conformal situations, uh, this proof kind of goes through. And, uh, and this, this situation where this holds is an open condition. So this is also this, this is what was interesting in this case, I think. So let me let, let me let me give you some example. So, so let me let me tell you something that we did. So we're going to put this SL2 here in, in SLD. So there are several ways to do this. So I'm going to pick this to be irreducible. So what do I mean by that? So the action, right? So let's call it tau D, say. So this action is equivalent to say that this action has no invariant subspaces. So there is one action like that, and there's only one. So this is some Lie, Lie algebra stuff. So we can do it by hand, actually. So like, you can consider KD. You can look at it as a span. So you can look at the homogeneous polynomials in two variables, for example. Say that the span of uh, D minus 1 is this. <coughs> So say, say that E1 is 0, 1, and E2 is 1, 0. And so your action of, of some SL2 guy in KD, you want to look at it in this basis as, uh, how do you act on this basis? You want to act on each of the, of the variables. Okay, so this is, this is just some definition, but so, there is an, so the point is there is an irreducible action of SL2 in SLD, there there's only one. So it's kind of the, history, the interesting way of putting SL2 in, SL, in SLD. <coughs> so the thing is, so here an element was, the action on, on perceptive space was conformal, but now when you look at it in SLD, it's no, it's no longer conformal. It's going to be some ratios, some, some powers of the singular values that you had before. So what, are, so what do we do? We're going to pick some convex or compact SL2, action of some gamma in SL2. So this is convex or compact. I'm going to put this irreducibly, as I said before. Right? So what we did is to show that when you deform this, there, there is also some sort of formula like this that's going on. So this is a statement, maybe say, uh, so this is a theorem, say. So there exists a neighborhood of that. So this, uh, this is, this is a, uh, an open set in this space, right? In the, in the, the space of morphisms. Uh, open. <coughs> Such that. So what's going to happen here? So we're going to look at the action. So let's, let's pick some rogue there, for example. 
when you look at the action of um, rho gamma in some Grassmannian, say. So this is going to have some, some limits uh, there. So this denoted by L, L gamma k, say. So this is, so L gamma 1 is, is the limit set in the projective space, and, and L gamma k is the limit set in the k planes. So what, we, what have we proved? We proved that the, this half of dimension of this guy is the critical exponent of some series. So what is the series now? It's going to be the ratios of singular values with the with the right guy. So this is going to be So another way to say this is this is going to be the limit as t goes to infinity, 1 over t log the number of elements in the group such that uh, the log Yes, 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 for any case. Yes. Okay, so this looks like um, a perturbation result, but in some sense, it's not. So there are kind of three steps in the proof. So one step is that there is some condition that we call Frené. So just say some any, any gamma, say any representation like this. So I'm going to write this word, uh, though I haven't defined it. So then, so let's say two Frenet. Then the half of dimension of the limit set in the projective space is the critical exponent of two over one. So I haven't defined this. This is important. I, I, I will say later. So, so this is like understanding Sullivan's proof, basically. <coughs> so the second step would be like the uh, Chouffrené is open. And uh, the third step to actually come to this theorem would be like uh, for every k, the representation of lambda k rho is true for me. So there exists u, exists u. So, <coughs> so this u here from this, right? So there exists a neighborhood of, of that guy such that for every k, So 
So this can be used in, it's in kind of different ways. Uh, one is to say that uh, this equal this, and the other one is to say that this equal this. <laughs> so for example, for example, so this, this, this is as a, as a corollary. We obtain some some result that we prove with with Raphael in I think 2014, maybe 15. Uh, <coughs> so something that we proved with uh, with, uh, with Raphael is that when you take a sur when you take a surface. So this is close it's a surface of uh, genomes greater than or equal to two. Close, connected, oriented, anything you want. So when you take this closed surface and you you put it in SLD R, right? <coughs> and here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, so this is the connected component belongs to the connected. Of, uh, of that guy. So here the deformation is arbitrarily large. So here I'm, I'm, I'm going, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it like this, but now I'm going to permit myself to go as far away as I want. Right? This, is, this is what's called a Hitchin representation. What we proved uh, with Rafael in this case is that when you look at the critical exponent, of a, let, let me give a name to this, otherwise I'm going to go crazy. Let's, let, let's say that this is HK of uh, Rho, say. We prove that we, when you look at the critical exponent, um, H1 of uh, Rho, this is constant A equal to 1. <coughs> Something that we prove with Raphael in um, 2014. So like you take a closed surface, you put it in SL2, then you put it in SLD, and then you deform uh, as much as you want. And uh, you look at the ratios of the first singular value and the, oh, so this is a Fourier case, sorry. This Fourier case. Look at the ratios of the k singular value and the k minus one singular value. This is just this is a constant number, that there is one. And uh, so in some sense, so what we did was something completely different or not. <coughs> and so it happens, so th this is a very typical, this is a very strange situation, at least for me, because all these limits says, uh, this is a theorem of, um, well, not all of them, but it's a consequence of what Fra uh, François Bogui showed, is that these limits are, are actually kind of regular, they are C1. For example, for example, something, something that, that, Franch uh, that François showed is that for this kind of examples, closed surface and R, so this limit set, L1, is, is a C1 curve. Uh, yes. How is the corollary? You, you know that the closed surface, you can take you the world is continent, or? Yeah, because, uh, so, so uh, as I said, this is, this is not a perturbative theorem. This is this, is this theorem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah so I, I, sh I should say this. I, I, I was... I was discussing, I was discussing with, uh, with Daniel Moncler, and uh, he told me that Moncler and Olivier and Tolosan, they have um, a similar result of this, similar proof of this fact using uh, the scattered dimension approach. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't exactly know what they do, so. Okay. So another consequence is that the scattered dimension is, is regular. It's analytic, actually, on this small neighbor. Uh, yes, sorry. Sorry about that. So let me give you. What can I say? So let me give you some hints of this proof. In some case, some special case. Hmm. 
so I think, so let me, so a month ago I thought I, thought I had, a, I thought we had a theorem, but now it's not a theorem anymore. <laughs> so now it's a question, if you want. So now if you want, it's a question. Uh, I mean, we have some arguments. I think it's true, but I don't know. So question. Um, so what you're gonna do is okay. You're gonna you're gonna pick this guy, right? You're gonna, you're gonna start with something like this, and you're gonna push it as far away as you can, right? As long as you always remain uh, far from the um, having coincidence on eigenvalues, right? And uh, I think that this holds for that situation. So, so consider rho. <coughs> Uh, a representation that can be connected to this standard one, to this standard representation that can be connected to that guy. Let's call it principal just to say a word so a principal rep uh, um, so we see the connected component but I'm going to ask more I'm going to ask that the path so the connected component of what of this principal representations but the path is always um, through representations that don't have coincidence on eigenvalues does not have any eigenvalue coincidences. Uh, so uh, here I, I gotta put a surface. Here I gotta put something, convex or compact is not enough, here I gotta put a surface. Uh, then uh, u, so this is, then this is u. So this is my question. So here I know that this, so th this condition, this, th this condition that I wrote obviously holds, well not obviously, but it holds uh, in U. So I'm gonna push this condition as far away as I can. And uh, my, what I think is that if you, if you start with a surface, closed surface, then in all this uh, big set, uh, this is going to hold. In particular, more specifically, I think that this is going to hold. This is going to hold. But I don't know. Yeah. What is the eigenvalue coincidence? So specifically means that the limit cone doesn't touch the walls. <laughs> so, sorry, yes. I don't understand. Can you connect it to your principal representation? So, the principal is this. Okay. This is the definition, just, just to give a name because I'm using it all the time. Of uh, here? No. Yes. So, okay, so here. Uh, the Laboris theorem is saying that the whole connected component is like, like that. But this is a very deep theorem. And here I am over C. Here I want to do it over C. Okay, wait, wait, wait. S is not compact here? Or S is compact, but this is over C. Ah, this is over C. This is over C. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pick some represent representation like this, but uh, now I'm going to do it over C. So let, 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 me, let me put it over C, because this is, this is what the actual, the actual question is. And the S is closed surface, and um, I'm going to deform it as much as I, as I can with uh, one restriction, which is, in all the paths that I make, there's no eigenvalue coincidences for any element. And the question is, uh, this, does this imply that formula? And I think it does. But, uh, but a month ago I would say, of course. Uh, now I don't say. I, now I say I don't know. The thing is, I, I don't think there are deformations. 
If the manifold is closed. I don't think there are. Maybe, maybe someone else. No, if you do this, so if, if, if your gamma was, 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 uh, was co-compact here, right? So, so over C, say, a, a closed <coughs> hyperbolic three manifold. Okay, you can do this, but I, I'm not sure that, I mean this, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that you can actually deform it inside here. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, something, to sh something I have to show. For surfaces or for, uh, for these open guys, it's much, easy. it's much easier to do it. Uh, you can do it by kind of by hand, but for when the manifold is closed. Uh, not locally, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I. Yeah, so this is the thing, right? In these kind of situations, right? Uh, you have to show that, uh, but this is independent, right? That this, this component is not a related component, right? It's not a point, for example. But uh, so in the open case, uh, this is with fine. Uh, so let me give you some hints of the proof. So in some special case. So let me give you some hints in some special case, and I, I hope this clarifies. Well, D equals true, you would be considering, like, for example, what, you, what would you be considering? Yeah, all, all complex co compact actions of the group. So, oh, oh uh, for, for the surface, oh, yeah, yeah, so for the surface, this definition is exactly uh, quasi function space. Right? Quasi function space is a quasi symmetric embedding, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have a question, if you, take a, if you take something on the boundary of quasi fluxian space, it may have no eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, I don't want to consider the boundary. Oh, okay, you're going to take the set and then take the interior. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then it's essentially structural stability. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So the quasi function, quasi function works fine, yeah. and the, and the formula it comes from uh, from uh, Sullivan actually. Well, actually from Bowen in the, in the quasi function space. I think. So you are not taking all the connected components of the representation. No. no. Um, I can't oversee over the connected component behaves uh, bad. Well, bad or good, it depends on what you want. Uh. <laughs> so in some sense, oversee what happens is that there is this open set that corresponds to very nice geometric representations. And, uh, and the limit corresponds to other more interesting things, but them itself, they are not geometric. So let me give you uh, some, some ideas of the proof. Vague, very vague uh, ideas of the proof. Uh, let me say that we're going to make it for k equal r and d equal 3. And gamma is going to be some uh, free group. So let me, let, let, me, let me kind of tell you what's going on here. I think so, so this kind of contains the whole. Uh, this kind of, in some sense, contains the whole argument, at least for, for, for the for number for k equal 1 here. So if you understand this case, you kind of understand everything. So <coughs> what, is this, uh, what, is this, what is this guy? So here we are looking at this SL2 r inside of SL3 r. And um, so what is this guy in this case? So there's two ways of doing this. So this, you, you either preserve a plane and, and then a one that's, that's not, not interesting. So this is the reducible one. So what is this guy? You can do it explicitly. So you can consider um, some quadratic form in R3, which is x squared plus y squared minus c squared. So this is from R3 to R. <coughs> right, and so you're gonna look at We're going to look at the group of, of linear transformations that preserve this linear form. Mm. 
right? So what's going on here? So this linear form, <laughs> where went, it, has this, it has this light cone. This is q equals zero, which is a, which is a cone because when you multiply by some number, the number goes out. And inside this cone, you have this this compact set. Which is what? This is q equal minus 1, I think. So it turns out that when you restrict your form to the tangent space of this subsurface, this linear form is, is positive definite. And so this gives you some Riemannian metric on this space, on this surface. So it turns out that this is actually constant, constant curvature. So you kind of identify this. That's a natural way, and it's not very hard to identify with this uh, hyperbolic <coughs> space. Exactly like that. I mean, you, you, you restrict your form to the tangent space to a point here, and it's actually positive definite. Because, OK, because, because Sylvester theorem, right? And so this guy has to be preserved by this group. So this guy is, is the isometry group of H2. So this, I, I just said some inclusion, but the other one is, is easy. Can be done. So this kind of gives uh, is a true R. Say isomorphic, or say uh, two is a true. Up to finite index, maybe finite index, or something like that. This is kind of saying something like that. And so, <coughs> when I projectivize this picture, right? When I projectivize this picture, what do I get? So this this cone is going to be some ellipse. It's going to be a differentiable ellipse. There's going to be some differentiable ellipse. So, so this is the projectivization of the cone. Right? So this ellipse is going to be preserved by the whole group, of course. So this, this is a regular ellipse. Let me put it this way because it's going to be important. And um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to fix some free group. I'm going to fix some convex co-compact action of some free group. So this is S O Q. Like this. So what is, what is this going to be? It's going to be some short k group, say. So this short k group. So we, when you look at when you look at it in H two. Right, the H2 picture of the group is, that, is this, right? So I, I said there was going to be a, a free group. So this is an open surface, no cusps. So the limit set is going to be some counter set. Limit set. So I mean, what I'm going to see on the other side is going to be some, so this limit set is going to be here. It's going to be some counter set inside this, this ellipse, this regular ellipse. But I'm also going to have just some counter set of, of lines, of tangent lines, which are actually at each point in the counter set, I look at the line. So I kind of have like two, two maps. Right. So in R3, right, in I have this, this counter set, right, to so the limit set. So I, I, I still haven't deformed anything. Everything is containing this ellipse, right? This counter, this is going to be some counter set. Uh, inside uh, the ellipse. And when I look at the action in the um, two planes, it 
there's going to be, of, there's going to be some, also some counter set of, of the tangent lines, right? So when you move it a little bit, when you move the representation now a little bit, so you kind of move your gamma and you change this. You move this in your and you change this. So this is going to be kind of, uh, this is going to be preserved and this is going to be preserved, except, the, except this part, because I don't have any tangent anymore. So let me just give a hint of, of, of let me just say something about that. So after small perturbation, so there's going to be some counter set that is preserved. So this moves, this kind of moves continuously. So this limit set moves, this limit set. And so, <coughs> so we're going to have some counter set now around. And uh, some kind of set of lines, except that the tangent uh, doesn't tangent to anything because uh, a priori you don't, you don't know what's going on. It's just some lines. So let me just say a hint about this move. Why this moves continuously? Because it's related to this conference. <coughs> so the idea is that, as Enrique explained two days ago, uh, dominated splitting is. Uh, the bundles move continuously, right? Mm -hmm. So hyperbolicity is eigenvalues move continuously, and the matrix splitting is bundles move continuously. So what's, what gonna, what's going to happen in this case? So th this is some idea of, of Laboury actually. He doesn't actually explain it in this in this form, but this is more or less what he's saying. To explain how this is continuously, so he's going to come up with some linear cocycle. Right? And uh, this linear cycle is going to have some dominated splitting. And when you pick a point in this, in this base space of this cycle and you look at the attracting uh, bundle of the dominated splitting at this point, you look at this line, it's going to lie here. Because it's going to be one of these points. So when you, when you move representation, the cycle moves a little bit. And so this domination is, is preserved. And so this, this point is moving continuously. So this is very, very, very vaguely. Uh, this idea of uh, Francois to actually explain uh, why this kind of this kind of picture is preserved. So, but there is something more. There is something more. So, let me just put it like this. Uh, this limit set. limit sets are the, are the projective trace of uh, the stable of the attracting repelling the bundles of some cycle having a uh, dominated splitting. So there are several ways to do this, some more efficient than others, depending on the purpose. So what we did with, with, with Jairo and uh, Rafael is also related to this, to this, this <coughs> idea a few years ago. And so this is the reason why the movie continues, right? So by now you have this, you know, now you are starting with this ellipse, right? So this ellipse kind of give you some extra, extra structure. Uh, 
So the ellipse gives you some extra st structure. Given by the by, by this ellipse. So this is before the formation, right? So what is this extra structure? So this is a convex set. So when you pick two points, so let me, let me do it in green. So when you pick two points, any two points, what is this extra structure? You pick, sorry, any three points. So the fact that this is convex is saying that when I, when I draw a line through two of, through two of them, it uh, doesn't contain the third guy. So given three points in this limit set, uh, this distinct, per was distinct, uh, the line between two of them, so these are two lines, I can take the, 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 the plane span by them, so this is this line actually. Does it contain the third? So this is okay. <coughs> so this extra structure is saying one. So there's two things about this extra structure. One that this is open. So this is not too hard. So I was saying before that the limit set vary continuously, right? So if x and y are far apart, the line the, line they span is, is, is continuous. The problem is that w when they get close, right? You don't, know, you, you don't have any continuity. But if they are far apart, the line is continuous. And, so, and this is moving continuously also. So if I move this a little bit, this line is going to move continuously. And this point won't be in that line because it wasn't there before. So this gives, this gives open when the points are far away. But the action on triples, so this is, this is some hat trick in some sense. So the action on triples is uh, properly discontinuous and co-compact. So this gives you, this allows you to always, if you have two points that are close, you can find some element that push, pulls them away and, uh, and apply the argument. So this, this argument actually comes from, from Francois Lavoury again, this, this kind of uh, stuff, this idea maybe. <coughs> so this is an open property. And, wh and what is this saying, this extra uh, transversality is saying that, okay, any time I pick two points in my limit set, no, now I have the form, right, and this is preserved. Uh, So this is going to be true. So for the nearby, so every time I pick two points and then look, look the line that joins them, uh, it's, gonna, it, it's not going to contain this third point. So these two points, I can pick them very close. I don't have to pick them. And now that I know it's open, there's no condition on them being, being far. It's just they have to be distinct. So I'm going to pick them close. And this, this line is far away from this line. So when I pick, when I pick, I don't know, some point here, say, and I look at this kind of cycle that I never actually explained, having this attracting point and this repelling point, what I'm saying is that the span of two points nearby doesn't intersect the repeller, the repelling bundle. So when I, I play my dynamics, it's going to converge to the attracting bundle. So this is kind of saying that uh, when I pick two points and I make, I, approach, I make them both approach some third point, it's going to converge to the red line, to the tangent, to the, to the, to the red line. So basically what you're saying is that, what does this prove? I, I haven't said anything about how the dimension, but what does this prove? Is that, okay, at the beginning, you, you started with some uh, counter sets and limit set containing some ellipse. So when you deform, uh, you don't you won't necessarily be inside that inside an ellipse anymore, but it's still going to be some sort of C1 counter set. And, uh, and this C1 counter set is going to you have to understand now how 
Now, now, now you have a tangent, right? So you, you have to understand the ellipses. Again, the, the ellipses that I drew at the beginning. And basically what you're saying is that when you, you pick your element, your limit set is really is going to come uh, inside the biggest axis. Uh, so let me just say a comment that in this kind of situation, uh, for, for um, k equal r, and uh, I don't know exactly more, I don't, I don't want to say more right now, but I know that uh, Fanny Cassell has some sort of uh, argument like this. Uh, also, but it's, it's about convexity, it's not about this uh, Frenet property that I didn't write. This is, what, this is true Frenet. Uh, Fanny Cassell and the Chef Danzinger and uh, Francois Gagnito also have some sort of convexity preserving, but, this, but for the real case, not in the complex case. Uh, so I think I should stop now. Thank you. So it's like yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly, exactly, And so this gives you some infinitesimal conformality, right? Yeah. And you can apply it again, uh, Sullivan stuff. So then you apply all the yeah. 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 This is the idea. Yes. yes. Can do this very quickly. And this is something. This is, this is pretty much related to what we did with with Shiro and Rafael. So I said before, right? And when you have a convex co-compact uh, action, right? A convex co-compact action in H three was uh, in H three. Convex co-compact action was that distances here, distances here are coercive equivalent to intrinsic distances in the group, right? And uh, this domain splitting comes from the fact that when you look at this kind of representations that I haven't actually defined, but the, the, the main property that's going to be around is that <coughs> instead of looking at distances in, in, in SLD, you're going to look at the ratios of singular values. Uh, this, is, this has to be comparable with the distance on the group, on the, on the group as an intrinsic. This is so. This is so. This is actually. This really comes from the work of uh, what we did with Jairo uh, uh, and Rafael. Uh, this is kind of the main uh, kind of quasi-isometric property that gives you the domination of some cosine. Oh, because, so, so this is a closed surface, right? So the argument I gave, so this is a closed surface, so now the limit set is going to be uh, the whole ellipse, right? And the argument I gave is, is saying that when you perturb a little bit, uh, it's still going to be a C1 curve. So what, what, what's actually very deep is the is, uh, Laboris theorem, or Francois Laboris theorem, right? You can move far away and still going to be a C1 curve. And actually, in, in this case, this is actually his argument. For small perturbations. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the initial three, yeah, yeah, of course. So initial three, this goes far away. So yeah. yeah uh, uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so this uh, this proof gives you that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what I was saying, like, okay, so in the so in this specific case, which is d equal three and k equal r, so uh, this this c one property holds. Uh, you, you can deform as much as you want, actually. This this is a local argument, and uh, that, that's a that's a deep theorem. It, so in, for this case, d equal three is probably. Uh, I don't know if it's Choi Goldman or maybe Benoit, maybe maybe it's Benoit, right? 
Troy Goldman, yeah. And then, uh, then for, uh, for K equal R and NED is uh, La Bourie. And, uh, okay, and uh, no, this is us. us in this, more generally, this is. Uh, okay, let's thank Andres again for very much.